In this segment on monopsony, I'd actually like to take a look at the monopsony labor market model. So let's begin by thinking about what this looks like. On the left, I've given us our basic monopoly model. And on the right, I've shown you the monopsony model. There are some similarities, but remember that all producers want to produce at a point where marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue. Well, in the labor markets, we think about that as marginal, excuse me, marginal expense of labor being equal to marginal revenue product of labor. Well, if you look at this model here for the goods market, as I said a few moments ago or in the prior segment, the monopoly producer produces a quantity of goods based upon where marginal cost is going to become equal to marginal revenue, so right at this point. That sets the monopoly quantity, and then we can take that quantity, place it into the demand relationship, and identify the price the monopoly producer could charge for this. It's not that the monopoly producer has to charge that, but the monopoly producer is a profit-maximizing producer. It's going to make as much uh, profitability as they can based upon this quantity, and so they're going to charge the highest price that they possibly can. They're using the profit-maximizing condition in their goods market. Well, the profit-maximizing condition in the labor market, a factor input market, is marginal expense of labor being equal to marginal revenue product of labor. So let's think about what this might mean for a moment. Here we have a marginal revenue product of labor curve, and recall from prior discussions that the marginal revenue product of labor is going to be synonymous with labor demand if we had a perfectly competitive market. And then we have, let's say, some marginal expense of labor. And I'll show you in a few moments why marginal expense of labor is above the labor supply curve, but for the moment, let's just accept that it is. Well, marginal expense of labor being equal to marginal revenue product of labor occurs right here. So we can then, based upon that, we see the quantity of labor that we're able to or that we choose to hire in order to meet this profit maximizing condition. And that's going to then tell us something about our marginal revenue product being equal to marginal expense of labor. But when we take that quantity of labor and subject it to the labor supply curve, remember the labor supply curve is going to be indicative of the supply of labor, which are the households and workers, and how much they are willing to work for based upon the number of them in a marketplace. Well, we see that the wage that the monopsony producer will pay will be significantly less than the uh, marginal revenue product or the, even the marginal expense of labor that they have for that amount of labor. This is no different, really, than this price of monopoly being significantly greater than P star or marginal cost here. What we see, then, is that the monopsony employer will employ a lesser number of workers than they would have had there been a market clearing relationship, which there is not here, but had there been that, and they're going to, they're going to employ fewer workers than that. They will pay them based upon the marginal revenue product, uh, or rather based upon the labor supply relationship, and what they're paying them will be meaningfully less than the uh, the marginal revenue product or marginal expense of labor. In fact, in monopsony, we find that the marginal expense of labor is consistently greater than the marginal or than the wage that is paid by the monopsony producer. It's also greater in almost every case than the amount W star might have been had there been a confluence of labor supply and labor demand. Let's look at this a little bit further. We once again have our, our market model here. We, we see our, our, our shape. Let's go ahead and think about how we form this shape, how we, how we form these values. And we'll do that by looking at a labor supply relationship. And we'll look at a price of output. And we'll look at a hypothetical labor demand, which might be uh, coincident with a marginal revenue product or labor relationship here. Let's assume I, that I gave you this entire uh, grid, this entire table to fill out. Uh, but the only values I gave you, other than what I've suggested in this labor supply, labor demand, and price of output, are the quantities produced based upon certain wages that are paid. Well, with that... With the information given, we can fill out literally the remainder of this graphic. I won't do all of it. I'll do a couple of, of rows of this so you can see where we're going here. Uh, but, but it's important that you know how to do this. And then we'll talk about, once you've done this, uh, how you interpret it and what we're thinking about. I, I guess at this point I should tell you that as an entrepreneur, 
as an investor, as a manager or decision maker in a labor environment, you live based upon your numbers. You may not realize it, but your goal always in this labor environment is to hire the number of workers where marginal revenue product of labor is equal to the marginal expense of labor. And you'll recall that in a competitive market environment, that's equal to the wage, which means that the marginal expense of labor is equal to the wage in a competitive environment. But we know in a monopsony environment, the marginal expense of labor is greater than the wage. But you still need to know your numbers. And when you know your numbers, when you analyze as carefully as you can, we tend to make far better decisions than when we're just shooting from the hip. So that's the whole purpose of thinking about this. Not, not only uh, are we thinking about why different workers are receiving different wages, but why you as a firm owner, entrepreneur, uh, decision maker might want to remember and recall this kind of information so as you're making labor decisions for your firm at some point in the future. Well, if we think about this, if I have a competitive goods market, and if I've suggested the price of output or P-star is 1, then P-star is going to be 1 regardless of the quantity being produced, if it's a competitive goods market. Because that's going to be our market clearing level. So we're just going to fill out this column by saying P-star or P equals 1. We can go ahead and think of what labor supply is because when we have a wage of 4 by putting 4 into the labor supply equation for W. So if our labor supply is negative 20 plus 5W, negative 20 plus 5 times 4 happens to be 0. Well, when, when it is 0, not only do we not have a marginal product of labor, we don't have a marginal revenue product of labor, we have a 0 total cost of labor, we do not have a marginal expense of labor. Okay, that's fair. Let's think about it when the wage is 5. Well, that would suggest when the wage is 5, the labor supply is 5. And the marginal product of labor, remember, marginal product of labor is equal to the change in quantity divided by the change in labor. This is the quantity of output. Change in quantity of output divided by the change in labor. Well, the change in quantity of output is 91. Change in labor is 1. Excuse me, the change in labor is 5. 91 divided by 5 is 18.3. And that is our marginal product of labor. Change in quantity of output divided by change in labor. What's the marginal revenue product of labor? It is the marginal product of labor times the price of the good. The reason I made the price of good 1 in this example is because it's so easy to calculate. 18.3 times 1 is simply 18.3. So what is the total cost of labor now? The total cost of labor is our wage times our labor units, or 5 times 5 at 25. Well, what's the marginal expense of labor? The marginal expense of labor is equal to change in total cost of labor divided by change in labor units. Well, the change in total cost of labor is 25. Change in labor units is 5. So the marginal expense of labor is 5. Let's go one more row just to make sure that you understand where I'm going here. So as we now think about a wage of 6, I can plug that wage into the labor supply equation. Negative 20 plus 5 times 6 is going to be 10. The marginal product of labor is going to be then the difference between 175 and 91, which is going to then be 75 and 9 or 84 divided by the change in labor of 5 which is going to give us a value of 16.7. That's our marginal product of labor. Marginal revenue product of labor is going to be marginal product of labor times the price of the output good, or again, 16.7. We now have a total price of labor of wage of 6 times labor units of 10. So total cost of labor is 60. And the marginal expense of labor is the change in total cost, or in this case, 35 divided by the change in labor of 5, so now it's 7. And you begin to see then how I'm, how I'm plotting the marginal expense of labor curve and how I'm plotting the labor supply curve. And you can even think about how we're plotting the marginal revenue product of labor curve. Let's do one more row just to solidify this. So if we have a wage of 7 into our labor supply curve, negative 20 plus 5 times 7, or plus 35 is going to be 15. Notice here, because of the way this is structured, our labor supply is moving up 
by five as our wage moves up by a dollar. That's indicated by the slope of our labor supply curve. It's upward sloping and we apparently have a slope uh, that's reflective of this. So our marginal product of labor is going to be the change in our quantity. So it looks like the change is 75 divided by the change in labor, which means we're going to have a marginal product of labor of 15, marginal revenue product of labor times, or is going to be 15 times 1, and then our total cost of labor will be 7 times 15. 7 times 15 is going to be equal to 105. So the change in total cost is 45 divided by the change in labor. So we have a marginal expense of labor of 9. Notice here that the marginal revenue product of labor is declining. The marginal expense of labor is increasing. The marginal revenue product of labor is declining. The marginal expense of labor is decreasing. And as we go further along here, as we continue to calculate out all these cells within this table, we're going to find that we get at a point either where marginal expense of labor and marginal revenue product of labor are equal to each other, or where we have the marginal revenue product of labor being just barely greater than the marginal expense of labor with the least amount of variance that we possibly can. So now I've gone ahead and I've filled out all of the different grid or uh, cells in this grid. This should be easy for you to do. You'll have an opportunity to do this in one of the review problems for this, for this module. So I've gone ahead and filled this out. And as I look here, I can kind of scan down the marginal expense of labor, marginal revenue product of labor, and I see that here uh, I have at a quantity of... Um, of, of 25 workers, I've got marginal revenue product 11.6, marginal expense of 13. I don't like that. My revenue product is, uh, in this case, uh, lower than my expense. I, uh, that that doesn't work for me. However, at uh, at 20 workers, my marginal revenue product of labor was was greater than my marginal expense of labor. And so there's something about this uh, that we've imposed here such that we have labor unit move movements by five, so maybe we hire five workers at a time in this example, such that our marginal revenue product of labor is the closest to our marginal expense of labor without being below it here at a quantity of 20 workers. So we're going to choose in this marketplace to hire or maintain 20 workers. When I put that 20 workers into my marginal revenue product of labor, which is the inverse of, mar of labor demand, I'm going to find that it yields a marginal revenue product of labor of 13.4. I've seen that already. It yields a marginal expense of labor of 10, but it would have yielded a W star possibly of, excuse me, a marginal expense of labor of 11, would have yielded a W star of 10, but when I put that 20 units of labor into my uh, labor supply curve, it's going to yield a wage of 8. And I'll do that by saying 20, 20, which is my labor supply, is equal to negative 20 plus 5W, or 40 equals 5W, or W equals 40 divided by 5, which is equal to 8. So I've simply plugged this value of 20 into my labor supply relationship, and it's told me how much I need to pay workers when I'm only hiring 8 or 20 of them in this market with this labor supply. So I'm only going to have to pay them as a monopsony producer. I'm only going to have to pay them $8 a unit, whereas they're earning for me $13.4 a unit. That difference is is a profit margin, a marginal profit margin for our producer here, which is significant. In fact, if you think about this, this area that we can define right here is the total cost of labor for us. That's total cost of labor. If we look a little bit further, then we have total revenue product from labor being the entirety of this area. And the difference between the total cost of labor and the total revenue, excuse me, the difference between the total revenue from labor 
minus the total cost of labor is some profit generated by labor. And we can see the marginal profit. We see the marginal profit is the difference between 13.4 and 11. But the, but the total might be important to us as well. So as we're thinking about <coughs> monopsony in the labor market, we're thinking about analyzing these values, seeing how many units of labor that we're going to hire, identifying what the marginal revenue product of labor is for that number of units, comparing it to the marginal expense. Marginal expense should be equal to it or just barely less than. And the premise here is we never want to leave some money on the table. We never want to uh, end up in a position where we're operating at a, even a marginal loss. Uh, that's, that's causing us to go backwards in our profit expectations. And in this case, we see that a marginal, uh, or rather monopsony in the labor market results in some fairly meaningful profit. What we haven't talked about then is employer or worker surplus. Well, I think employer surplus, uh, employers are the consumers of labor, so employer surplus is, might be in this area here. Employer surplus is a consumer of labor. Uh, but the real surplus that we're thinking about for the employer is this profit margin. It's this whole, it's this area right here. And the worker surplus, were there to have been any, uh, you can't really tell what this would be, uh, because we don't have the basic demand and supply relationship. But we might think of worker surplus in this area here that might be this triangle which means we might be able then to finally think of some deadweight loss in this area here. This might be some deadweight loss. And anytime we have deadweight loss, we can very quickly see why uh, we have some inefficiency in the market as a function, in this case, of monopsony labor.